Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today we're going to be looking at uh, a very popular uh, weapon. Um, it's manufactured by a company called LWRCI. Uh, LWRCI has been in various uh, iterations of the company around for quite some time. In fact, when you talk about the external piston gun, uh, you have to talk about LWRCI because they were one of the pioneers. Uh, right around the same time, uh, LWRCI was working on an external piston, so was uh, H and K, and so was um, PWF USA. So you know those three companies are pretty much uh, you know the founding fathers of the uh, of the external piston. Although Colt had been manufactured an external piston in the uh, 1960s. Um, so if you want to say who was the first external piston, it was Colt. It was the Model 703 that was put out in the mid 60s. Um, that uh, was put out just in case the, the military would still want to go to an external piston because of the problems in Vietnam. However, uh, the problems got corrected due to the uh, I Corps congressional hearings, and uh, the rifle's gone on to be the most successful rifle in U.S. history. Uh, the U.S. military had never really expressed any interest in uh, external piston. Uh, it wasn't until uh, the early 2000s when the controversy really came about. But um, there's definitely been a segment of the of the of the country uh, of, the, of the, the industry who uh, does prefer the external piston versus the direct gas. And fortunately, uh, this is a, a buyer's market, so uh, whatever uh, flavor that you like, you can actually get. Um, but uh, this rifle here represents the state-of-the-art uh, LWRC rifle. It's called the Individual Carbine Enhanced. Um, let's talk a little bit about where this rifle actually came from. This rifle came out of the Individual Carbine Program uh, that was put out by the U.S. military in an effort to find a rifle to replace the M4 carbine. As the Individual Carbine Program uh, progressed, uh, many, com many companies throughout the industry submitted uh, entries. Uh, there was the requirements they wanted ambidextrous and so forth and there wasn't any specific uh, wording for external piston but it was, it was very much implied uh, that they wanted it. Of course the M4 was going to be the baseline. Uh, LWRC went and they designed their own individual carbine which basically what you see here is uh, for the most part their entry. Except uh, LWRC had some good foresight. Uh, they saw the program, they saw how it was going, uh, they saw that the program wasn't really being taken seriously, and uh, they also, I think, saw that there's a lot of companies who were putting a lot of money into a program to win a contract that probably was never going to happen. So rather than invest all that money and continue trying to go forward with the, with the program, they dropped out of it. Um, the rifle did not fail out of it. LWRC had just decided strategically that you know, it wasn't a program they felt was going to go anywhere, uh, and it wasn't worth uh, the time or the effort, you know, to invest in a program they knew was going to was going to fail. Um, which was which was right. Uh, they probably saved themselves a lot of money compared to a lot of other companies out there who who spent a lot of money to develop weapon systems for uh, the individual carving that the, you know, for the program just to be canceled. Uh, but we're going to take a look at this rifle from butt to muzzle and see a lot of things that actually make this rifle unique. Um, Quality-wise, LWRC is, uh, is second to none. Um, I've had the opportunity to visit their manufacturing facility. Uh, it is state-of-the-art, um, all modern CNC machines. Um, they actually have their own hammer forge machine to make uh, their own barrels. Um, all LWRC barrels are all going to be uh, hammer forged. Um, they even have molding in-house for plastic for as far as grip panels and, and whatnot. Um, I have to say, you know, being to many manufacturers and seeing a lot of them, one thing that was particularly interesting about uh, the BRC was uh, their massive use of fixtures and assembly. Um, they have a fixture for everything, which basically means they could bring anybody in off the street and have them put rifles together in no time. Uh, because of the simplicity and the use of the fixtures, uh, they're able to hold a degree of quality that is just, uh, that is just excellent. Um, their facility is uh, in Cambridge, uh, Maryland. Um, they have uh, you, know, you know ranges in there for testing. Um, they have had some decent contracts, decent military contracts overseas. Uh, in fact, uh, they sort of made history. Uh, they were the first company ever to sell uh, 6.8 SPC guns to a foreign military, and they had a pretty good sized number. Um, their designing capabilities are excellent. They think outside of the box. Uh, their, models, their uh, Model 6-8 is a perfect example of that. Um, 
they took a chance and realized that uh, there's been a problem with the 6.8 SPC cycling in the magazines. So they took the foresight to say, you know what, we're going to fix it. And they recreated a lower receiver and, along with Magpul, designed a proper 6.8 magazine uh, to increase the reliability. So they, uh, they're not stuck in the way things have always been. They are willing to try new things. Um, they offer these weapons in many different configurations, uh, different, different length handguards. Uh, they have short barrel guns. They have uh, you know, pretty much anything that you could imagine. Uh, they offer uh, 6.8, they offer 5.56, they offer the, the Reaper in 7.62. Um, all of it is based around uh, the short stroke uh, piston system. So uh, let's take a look at this, this thing from butt to muzzle and we'll see what makes these guys special. Some of the first things I want to point out in this rifle too is its excellent ambidextrous features. Uh, this rifle is fully ambidextrous. The uh, controls are fully mirrored on each side. We have, uh, this is actually a proprietary uh, safety lever. It's made of polymer. It's both uh, right and left side. We have uh, ambidextrous bolt catch. And one of the nice things about this bolt catch, many of the ambidextrous ones that are out there, they can only be used as a bolt release. You can't actually lock the bolt open. But with this particular model, you hold the bottom down, pull the bolt back, it actually will uh, hold open as well as be able to close. You have the magazine release in the thermal location. Looking over to the left, we have the ambidextrous magazine release. Of course, the bolt catches in the standard location. And you also have the uh, safety in the standard location. We have an LWRC winter trigger guard, which is uh, elongated, so it's very easy to... Uh, Use it even with gloves. Back to the right, we have, uh, uh, you know, of course you have your ejection port, fire cartridge case deflector, and forward assist. We also have an ambidextrous charging handle. It's uh, truly ambidextrous, available uh, on both sides here, uh, which is also an excellent feature. Comes on the rifles also is uh, the LWRCI backup sights. They're called the skirmish sights. These are fairly unique in the industry as well. To adjust these, you rotate the top. So you have your various apertures uh, on the top. So you have your small for your longer, your uh, long range, and you have your larger ones for the shorter range. They are adjustable for uh, windage, not elevation. The front side itself is uh, adjustable for uh, elevation on the front. To fold, you just push in the button, drop them in place. Uh, these skirmish sites are extremely high quality. They, uh, they're very low profile, which is excellent. Uh, for optics on here, I have a, a, a DI optic. Uh, this is uh, called the Rave 2. Um, it's a red dot sight, uh, which you have touchpad uh, power up, down, and it's also night vision compatible. This is an excellent uh, optic for the money. Um, they're probably about half the price or so of uh, what Aimpoint is. And they're just, in my opinion, they're just as good. Um, I've been using these for quite some time, and I've done several endurance tests lately on guns, which are like 6,000 round tests, and I've used them. And uh, there's not one problem with them. Um, you know, I'm actually a very uh, fond of the of these, the Dioptic line. They have several good um, options out there. It's also on an arm throw lever mount. Again, uh, I prefer this mount uh, to, to any other mount for a military rifle. Um, it's nice to be able to have uh, the ability to just throw a lever and knock the scope off the scope's not working so you can engage your iron sights but uh the di with the di optic i also have co-witness so if my optics were to go down i can engage the backup sights and i have co-witness from the uh right through the scope so regardless of whether the scope works or not uh, i'm going to be able to use my sights looking forward this particular barrel is the actual individual carbine 14.7 inch barrel. This rifle came uh, with a pinned on uh, flash suppressor, you know, because of course with a 14.7 with inch barrel you have to have the, the proper length on the uh, muzzle device and it has to be pinned in place permanently. So uh, due to the fact that I have uh, silencer coke cans, um, I contacted LWRCI and I sent this back. They removed uh, the pinned on flash suppressor they had and they installed the uh, silencer coke for me and did a beautiful job installation, uh, beautiful job on the pinning, looks very nice. Looking at the front sight base, or gas block, you can see there's a bayonet lug down here. 
Uh, it's also pinned to the uh, barrel as well. Again, this is something you'll hear me in many of my videos talking about is the benefits of having a pinned on gas block versus a uh, one that's held on by set screws or uh, by bolts. Um, when you don't have that secu this this front base that side base uh, secured, what can happen is is uh, with rapid fire or full automatic fire, that front sight base can actually start migrating forward, and eventually you'll start getting short stroke, and then it'll cut the gas off completely. Now, what a lot of people are doing now is putting a dimple on the underside of the barrel, so one of the uh, set screws actually goes into that uh, dimple, preventing it from moving forward. That's 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 fine. Um, I certainly have no problem with that. Um, if I have the option, I will always have a, uh, I will always have my the gas blocks um, drilled and pinned in place. Looking at the stock, we have a six position stock. This is a more compact uh, LWRCI stock. Looking at the receiver extension itself, you will notice that we have uh, dual QD points, which I, have, I actually have one in use here. Two quick attachment points. Now LWRC on the handguard. Uh, what we have here is their snakeskin patterns, uh, uh, rail protectors. They do provide you with uh, uh, and, and with with the gun uh, three different uh, lengths of uh, detachable mill standard 1913 rail, and they also provide one that actually has a QD point, which you can put on your side. And if you look from the bottom here, you have one that's a hand stop as well. Um, this this handguard is completely uh, free floated, and it also has the, the ability for you to configure any way you see fit. So if you wanted to put a vertical pistol grip, you can put one of the uh, rail sections on the bottom. Uh, I have this here because at some point I'm planning on putting a flashlight on this, which is why I left that there. And then I have the just the grip panels uh, over it. But I do have several different uh, rail segments uh, that I can then be able to use as well with it. Um, this particular rifle is uh, is is black. Um, they do a lot in Coyote tan. In fact, the actual individual carbine uh, required actually a. Uh, a coyote tan or, or coyote, you know, whatever you want to call it, flat dark earth. There's main different names for the same colors. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the inside. We're going to take a look at the uh, unique bolt carrier group and we're going to take a look at the actual piston system. Separating the upper and lower receiver, a couple things I'd like to do to take a look at here. The actual trigger group itself is all nickel boron coated. That's a, it's a, uh, Corrosion resistant, as well as it gives a, a good lubricity to it, as well as you know the moving parts. Um, the you know, hammer trigger and disconnector all have that. Also, take a notice right here as well. You have an adjustable uh, bolt down here, which enables you to tighten the uh, receivers, so um, you can you know get rid of any rattle. This can be adjusted from the factory. There's no reason to touch it at all. And. Uh, Pretty much any uh, external piston gun you will have in this caliber or in this family of weapons will have an H2 buffer. Uh, that's necessary because you have a much faster opening stroke uh, and it's used to try to slow down the socket rate uh, as well as to uh, deal with bolt carrier bounce. Uh, some of these barrels are much heavier than uh, a standard M4 barrel as well, which is another reason why you need a, an H2 buffer in it uh, to prevent bolt carrier bounce on fully automatic. Uh, these rifles are made in selective fire, uh, available all over the world. I'm going to take a look at the upper receiver. The bolt carrier itself is very unique. Uh, in fact, it's patented. Uh, the, the, the early LWRC rifles had actually a two-piece uh, carrier, which you actually had uh, this, what they call tombstone, was actually uh, in place of where the gas key was. And, you know, they had found that uh, that they break. Uh, you know, the, uh, the carrier key screws will snap off. Uh, the actual, uh, you know, notch that slipped into the, uh, and the carrier would snap off. So they came up with a one-piece design. And as you can see, the uh, tombstone here is all one piece. You have these flares in the back as well. Uh, what these flares do is they uh, they work to prevent uh, bolt carrier bounce. What bolt carrier bounce is is when the uh, piston strikes it's slightly off center. So if you notice, so if you notice, it starts to move, it moves it down. Where it's not in line. A standard M16, you would have the gas would go into the into the uh, bolt carrier. It would evenly distribute, and it would blow straight back. Well, with the external piston, you don't have that. You have a smack into here and a slight tilt. So that's what this does here. Is it actually gives you uh, protection against having the you know the carrier tilt. 
And uh, LWRC is quite fond of the uh, nickel boron finishes. Uh, as you see, they use it on their boat carrier groups as well. Um, I, I am not one to say that uh, it's lubeless. I, I don't believe that. I believe anytime you have metal touching metal, it needs to have uh, lubrication. I will say that uh, it's much easier to clean. Uh, you know, these don't get very dirty unless you use a can. Uh, quite frankly, when you use a can, this doesn't look any different than a DI gun does, a direct, direct impingement gun. Um, all the blowback that comes back out of the chamber, you know, when you pull out the bulk carrier group, it's black. Uh, that's just one of the characteristics of actually using um, a, uh, a sound suppressor. I'm going to take a look at the actual gas system right now. You have two two bolts here we're going to back out till they stop. They're captive. You want to engage the uh, site. And this exposes you to the actual gas system itself. So you have what's called here the intermediate rod. You have the operating rod. You have the nozzle and you have the actual piston itself. So this is the uh, very simple system. Uh, that is, it's a simple push rod system. Uh, there's nothing really you know, unique about it uh, for as far as, uh, as a short stroke piston works. Again, what a short stroke is versus a long stroke, if it was a long stroke, this operating rod would be attached to the carrier. So basically you have, uh, when the system blows back, the rear knocks into the bolt carrier, knocks it back, and then the spring returns it forward. It releases all the ex the, uh, the gas, uh, unused gas, out to the front here. And you also see we have uh, these, not these notches on here. This is sort of a, if you want to say a self-cleaning mechanism, it's like a, it works as a, as a scraper uh, right here on the nozzle. Um, simple, robust, um, and, and reliable. Um, this is definitely a proven system. It's been out there for quite some time. Now, talking a little bit more about the individual carbine, this was designed with a heavy barrel. As you can see when you look through here, this is actually a heavy profile, profile barrel. Unlike the uh, M16, M4, well, actually the M4 carbine's lightweight barrel. Um, that was done for a couple reasons. One, due to the heat. Um, one of the things that was experienced over in Afghanistan and Iraq was uh, the ambient temperature would be so high, before you would actually pull a trigger, you could have a barrel that's 150 degrees easy. Um, and also with extensive fire, um, the other guns would overheat. Uh, so by having a heavier barrel, uh, it works better as a light support weapon, it dissipates heat better, uh, it's more reliable during uh, extensive engagements, um, which was something that the U.S. government found when uh, they went to the M4 uh, product improvement. And that product improvement included replacing all the standard 14 and a half inch barrels with uh, the SOCOM heavy barrels. So having that barrel heavier, uh, you know, soldiers don't like carrying anything that's heavier, but in a case like this, this is a definitely an enhancement to their weapon system. But in all fairness to the M4 carbine, it was designed as a lightweight carbine. It was never designed as a uh, main battle rifle. Um, it was put into that role. So to say that the M4 was deficient uh, in the area of that is, uh, I don't think that it's fair, uh, because it was designed as a carbine was supposed to replace a, a guy who, who who couldn't carry an M16 because it was too big and but needed more power than a pistol. Uh, that was what a lightweight carbine was 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 for. Uh, and then with it being thrust into uh, being the primary weapon, um, it was really designed. It was really doing things that wasn't designed for. And the the, the PIP program or the Product Improvement Program, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, made the rifle more of a, of a streamlined battle rifle than just a. Uh, you know, a carbine that was that was meant for, uh, you know, not essential personnel who needed to carry a weapon but needed more power than a pistol, and didn't want the didn't want the length of a full length rifle. Um, these are all nitride coated. Um, the uh, they decided to go against uh, you know the standard mill spec uh, with the chrome plating. Now many believe that uh, the nitriding is better. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, um, I can't really give you an opinion on whether it's better or not. My experience has mostly all been with mil-spec guns, Colt, LMTs, um, that, that utilize the, uh, the chrome-plated barrels. Now, um, you know, there certainly is a difference between a stainless steel barrel and a chrome-plated barrel for as far as, you know, accuracy. You know, there's a big difference between the accuracy of a stainless steel barrel versus a chrome-plated. Uh, there's definitely a difference in accuracy between a heavy barrel versus a, a standard uh, barrel. But for as far as what the uh, 
what the, the nitride does. Um, in theory, it's supposed to, uh, you know, through harden without the need for chrome plating, it's supposed to be you know, harder than regular steel. Um, that's one of the things over the over the next uh, several months or next year or so that I want to play with some more is to get my own outlook on, uh, on how exactly uh, the the nitriding benefits over the standard chrome plating. Reassembly is very simple. Just insert the uh, piston. Then we're going to insert the uh, operating rod, and now we insert the intermediate rod. Pull back on the operating rod. So that's all there is to it. That's the gas system. Very simple. The handguard is, uh, as you see, it's it's, it's free floating. Uh, it is two piece, um, proprietary barrel nut. Um, the rifle is no more or less difficult to work on than uh, any standard M4. Um, there isn't that many extra components to it. Um, these rifles, I've uh, had an opportunity to mess with several of them over the years uh, to be able to determine whether or not uh, you know they're reliable in different different configurations and different climates. Um, I've had these in the nice Arctic, upstate New York uh, winter, um, and had no issues at all with reliability. Um, it's been very interesting watching this company mature, uh, just to see all the different things that they've done throughout the years, um, their evolution going from. You know, just the conversions, converting rifles over to their own receivers and the refinements of the gas system. There's no question that LWRCI is one of the industry leaders uh, in external piston guns. Uh, however, for the first time, they broke ranks and they actually uh, introduced a DI gun, which, uh, you know, it surprises me, but it's also smart. Um, if you have customers who are asking you for it, you can either uh, provide it for them or send your business to somebody else. So it makes, a, it makes a lot of business sense to just be able to uh, say, okay, you want that, I'll make it for you. Uh, which some companies have uh, lost a lot of business because they've, uh, they've not done that. Uh, LWRC uh, saw the, the bigger picture and uh, even though this is what they were famous for, they still offer uh, the DI to customers who want it as well. The uh, LWRCI individual carbine, as part of the individual carbine requirements, um, needed to be set up to use a sound suppressor. And that's exactly what it is. Um, this rifle, like a, all the individual carbine rifles, was very well thought out. And we're going to show how the suppressor works on here. The suppressor that I, uh, I use is the uh, Silencer Co. Saker 556. Um, this is an excellent suppressor. Um, locks in place very well. This is the actual flash suppressor uh, that also works as the mount. Um, just going over a little bit of this. Um, this rifle came with uh, LWRCI's uh, proprietary um, flash suppressor uh, that was pinned in place because this is the actual 14.7 inch barrel. This is the actual individual carbine length barrel. Um, so you know, I contacted them and said, uh, can you send me another upper? I want you to put on uh, you know, the silencer co uh, flash suppressor so I can use my can. They said, no, just send us the upper receiver back, so, which is what I did. Uh, they removed their uh, flash suppressor, installed my uh, silencer co one on there, they pinned it in place, so now we're good to go. So for the installation of the silencer co, uh, Saker 556, so it stops, then we have a locking ring. We're going to lock that in place. And now we have the actual gas valve itself. Right now it's in the standard position for standard uh, operating conditions. Now we're going to flip that upwards, it says S up, that's for suppressors. What that does is it cuts the gas system down, so um, it backs off on uh, gas. What happens is, is when you use a sound suppressor, you extremely overgas the system. So say you have a rifle that has a rate of fire generally around uh, 800 rounds a minute. You can increase that up to 900 to 1,000 rounds a minute with it could do all the back pressure coming back. And what that does is, first of all, throws the timing of the, of the rifle off. You're starting to uh, open the bolt uh, too soon. So basically you have a cartridge case that's uh, still expand it when you're trying to extract it, which can cause failures to extract. And it can also cause um, extreme wear on the components because again, if a parts are designed to fire at 800 rounds a minute, you start bringing it up to uh, 1,000 rounds a minute, those parts are gonna wear a lot quickly, more quickly. So by having a gas valve on here, you're able to adjust the gas so you can keep it running at the same um, operating, operating parameters with and without the suppressor. 
Um, any gun that has a suppressor on should have this. This is a, this is a, a major benefit, um, you know, to the longevity of the rifle. Uh, suppressors uh, traditionally are not good for guns. Uh, you know, they they cause overpressure and, and overworking. So really, you want to have a rifle that's designed to be uh, work with a suppressor for ideal conditions. In case you were wondering what this magazine was. Uh, this is a magazine I've been testing for quite some time. Uh, this is manufactured in Germany. It's uh, Hera Arms. Um, you can see it's got a spine back here, which you can actually see uh, the rounds in the back. Uh, this is indication of 20. This is indication of 30 rounds. Um, it's a it's a very thick polymer, very durable. I've been using these using these magazines for quite some time. I've been extremely pleased with them. Um, I've used them in probably oh god, I'd say 30, 40 different rifles. Um, as a writer, uh, as somebody who tests guns, pretty much every mag every rifle I get that actually uh, uses an M16 type magazine, I probably have 10 different magazines that I test for uh, magazine compatibility. And this magazine's been in that mix for the last couple years. Uh, and I've never found any rifles that uh, that this one's been acted up in with any problems. They do offer these in a solid color as well, uh, without, the, without the window, but obviously people tend to like the window. Um, they offer them in different colors as well. It's uh, very unique also in the way that it uh, comes apart. You actually slide out a, a lever. And it toggles out. The magazine comes apart. So it's very easy to clean. Uh, all you would need would be, would be a bullet tip to take it apart. Um, German engineering at its finest. That back together, toggle it back in place, slide that up oh, wrong way, slide that back in place. So that's a uh, little take on the Hera magazine. Overall, uh, myself, I'm a direct gas guy, I tend to prefer direct gas systems, however, uh, you know. You can't deny uh, the external piston works as well. Um, I like to tell people when they say, ask you what's better, direct gas or, or, or piston. It's uh, it's sort of like two different ways to get to the same place. Um, basically, and the operating system is just a way that you knock the bolt back, uh, whether it be with an external piston or whether it be with uh, uh, direct gas. It, I guess it depends on your opinion because quite frankly, they both work. Um, they both, I think, perform equally. Um, when you consider what the what a battle is, uh, the Army considers a battle 300 rounds. Both a direct gas and a uh, external piston will do that without a problem. This will fire a thousand rounds without cleaning. An M16A1 that I've tested myself will go with a thousand rounds without cleaning. I've had M4 carbines that have gone uh, 1500 rounds without cleaning. So um, really, you have to ask yourself uh, what's the criteria to make one better than the other. According to the criteria that the U.S. Army puts out, they both work. So I guess I'm not really going to tell you which one's better. I'll say that uh, they're both two ways to get to the same position, uh, and you choose for yourself. Um, I don't believe some of the hype that you hear about the piston guns. For instance, they say, well, the bolt carrier stays cooler. Yeah, but uh, so what? The, in order for the bolt carrier and the direct gas gun to get hot enough for it to cause any problems with the, uh, the springs or the bolt itself, the barrel were blown up a long time over. So yeah, it keeps it cooler, but it's, it's no big deal. The reason I'm saying this is because there's a lot of things that are said when you compare the direct gas to the external piston. There are some things that are said that are not necessarily true, and, and that's one of them. You know, uh, if you look at what the actual heat treating is on the springs and everything, and, and you know, for extractor springs and injector springs and whatnot and pins, um, the, 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 the bulk carrier would never get hot enough to, to affect that. Um, and, it, and if it did, the gun would have been blown up. So. Uh, yeah, I really want to put them more on an equal playing field uh, with the external piston and the direct gas. Um, you probably do have a benefit uh, with the external piston with the uh, using a suppressor in shorter barrels. Uh, I do believe that uh, there is a benefit in shorter barrels. But 14 and a half inch barrels, 20 inch barrels, um, I think that it's just two different ways to get to the same, the same place. Uh, LWRC is one of the founding fathers of uh, uh, the external piston gun. They've remained an industry leader uh, for many, many years uh, for as far as uh, uh, external piston technology uh, and precision rifles.
they've come a long way over the years growing out of a small company into uh, a major firearms manufacturer <clears throat> uh, currently uh, the owner of uh, LWRCI uh, has a series of uh, businesses uh, all of them have to do with manufacturing uh, so through his through one owner you have a company that's able to do many different manufacturing processes on these guns uh, which increases the quality and I think uh, we can see a lot of things coming from these guys in the near future as well now we're going to take the LWRCI individual carbine to the range and we'll see how she can do. We're going to fire the uh, LWRCI individual carbine in both suppressed and unsuppressed. So the first 20 rounds we're going to do is in the uh, unsuppressed mode. Now we're going to go to suppressed. We're going to install our. Uh, this is actually the Saker 5.56. Five, I received this rifle from LWRC. It came with their standard flash suppressor. Um, it was this is the actual IC 14.7 inch barrel. Their flash suppressor was pinned on, and I sent them over the. Uh, Silencer Co. flash suppressor so I can install the suppressor. They removed it, uh, installed this one, pinned it in place. So what we're going to do now is we're going to switch the gas system over to suppressed. One flip, so now we're in suppressed mode. This is going to cut back on the gas so we don't have the issue with uh, the overgassing. One thing you do get with suppressors, you actually get uh, a lot of that gas blowback. Um, that's unavoidable. It doesn't matter whether you have an external piston or if you have a uh, direct gas. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. If you liked it, please click on like and subscribe. Thank you.